Right. I've got to say, this is probably the best political moment in my life so far. And I've had some good ones, I'll tell you. I really am lost for words. No, I'm not lying. Right. <laughs> when the campaign first started, me and a, mm -hmm. another colleague, we had a few leaflets and we went over to a young Labour meeting at a, a trade union office just across the oh, way. And we were giving the leaflets out. It was only a few days after Jeremy had got on the ballot paper. And I was handing I'm these leaflets out. And uh, two of the full MPs came. One of the MPs was very friendly, he said, no, I'm not interested, Joe, it's, it's not for me. Another of the MPs was very aggressive and an argument ensued and he went in. But at that moment, I knew politics is changing, politics is different. I didn't, didn't get angry and I don't wish them any wrong, none whatsoever. But what I do wish is we, we, we all had MPs like Jeremy who had the bravery, the conviction oh God, to stand up to what they believe in not Fleet Street tells them to believe and I think that's the difference. So, where's the sister take a picture of my arms like this? So, it's, it's, it's on behalf of the city, on behalf of my birth city, on behalf of all of you, on behalf of Full, welcome Jeremy Corbyn! Especially big thank you to Richard Bergen for calming everybody down. <laughs> R Richard, you just made an incredible message there of what politics can, must be and will be about in the future. And I want to say a big thank you to Richard. He was elected only just over a year ago to Parliament, made an incredible impact. And while some people were walking away from responsibilities and resigning from the shadow cabinet, Richard accepted promotion to take on the very big task of shadow justice secretary. Richard, thank you very much for that and for the work you do in that. And a big thank you to all the other speakers for what they've said today. And if I may say personally, a big thank you to my good friend, Councillor Micheline Ngongo Safi, who just spoke. Think about her and her life, you probably don't know her terribly well. English is her seventh language. She grew up in the Congo. She suffered from the wars in the Congo. She eventually came and made a home in Britain. Made a fantastic contribution to my community locally. And I was so proud when she was elected to our borough council last year. So when you kids start complaining about people, think of Micheline and the massive contribution she makes to transforming the lives of young people in my community and the message she's giving about peace and justice and working together all over the world. Now Hull has an incredible history, an incredible history of a city that's produced so many great people. Great people that have gone on to change the world is the poetry city of Britain. And I'm looking forward to being back here during the year of culture in order to have a public debate and discussion about human rights, human rights around the world, human rights around Europe, and human rights at home, rights at work, and all are the rights that our children should be brought up being proud of, not afraid of. Maybe they should stop reading the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph. <laughs> and of course, uh, Wilberforce, who uh, piloted the abolition of the slave trade through Parliament, came from Hull. Yes, he did a fantastic job in that, and we should all be very proud of that. But we should remember that that achievement was because so many people revolted against the slave trade all around the world and the indignity and injustice of it. And of course the other great person who came from the area is Mary Wollstonecroft, 
who grew up in Beverly and is remembered every year in a lecture at Hull University, eventually made her way to my constituency, praised and wondered at the great works of Tom Paine, the rights of man, thought about it and said, hang on a minute, hang on a minute, and wrote the treatise on the rights of women and opened a girls' school. So Hull simply changed the world absolutely changed the world and it's on the backs of people like Mary, like Tom Paine, like so many others that all the things we have achieved are really developed from. Never be afraid of looking at the history of our own movement, our own party and those people that pioneered those ideas. Surely we want to live in a society where people think widely have a cultural policy and attitude that encourages ideas, encourages poetry, encourages thinking about where our rights come from. They're never ever handed down from above, they're won from below by people standing up. And so when we challenge what this government is doing, the economic orthodoxy of this government for the very richest, you spend less on the very poorest, then somehow or other you get a more developed growing economy. It's quite hard to get your head around this because the logic escapes me. In reality, what this government has achieved in the past year and in the past six years has been a growing gap between the poorest and the richest within our society. That gap is getting wider and wider and wider. The proportion of company income that's spent on wages is falling. The proportion of national income that goes on wages is falling. The proportion of national income that goes on dividends, on tax relief for the super rich, and money that's placed in tax havens is rising. We know which side the Tories are on. We know what they are doing. But we also have to recognise that in the last election, tragic as our defeat was, we have to think about why we lost that election. I fought very hard in my constituency, as Richard did, as other colleagues did all over the country. We had some very good stuff in that manifesto, no question about that. And a Labour government would be ten times better than anything we've got. But I simply say this, if we don't challenge the economic idea that growing inequality is somehow or other a price worth paying and that further cuts in public spending, freezing of public sector wages are a price worth paying, sorry, they are not. What the Labour Party and the Labour movement has to exist for is redistribution of wealth and power and a growing economy to provide decent jobs for all of our young people. And then, of course, in modern corporate Britain, how does this play out? Philip Green, you've all heard of Philip Green. <laughs> this, no, I do kind politics, you can just say you don't like him. <laughs> Philip Green, um, BHS, for example. He walks away, leaving a big hole in the pension bill, leaving lots of people unemployed, leaving lots of debts all over the place, and retreats to a tax haven on a very expensive yacht. Sorry guys, Not allowed. this guy, like many others, has taken a great deal by exploiting the people that worked in his stores. He has got to be brought to account for what he's done. The idea that we can run an economy where the chief executive, managing director, chairman or any one of those in a senior executive position can live in a tax haven, siphon their profits off, invest nothing here and take profits away, I'm sorry, under a Labour government from 2020 or sooner, those days are over.
a number of other examples I could give. My great friend Dennis Skinner describes, thank you, and Dennis has been a fantastic support for this campaign and a fantastic support for what we've been trying to do in Parliament in the past 10 months. Dennis is a real comrade. He pointed out that he used to work at Shirebrook Colliery. He was a miner. They don't coal. They were in the union. They were reasonably well paid compared to what followed. They lived in the local community. They worked together as a community. They didn't care what their nationality was, what their ethnic group was or anything else. They were miners relying on each other underground for their own safety. They were a community of strength. Thatcher came along. The Tories came along. They destroyed the mining industry and tried to destroy the mining union with it. I have to say, they didn't succeed in destroying the mining union. Durham Miners Gala, 10 days ago, was the biggest ever. And yesterday, sadly, we buried Davy Hopper, but we remember him with affection for all he achieved. And so, when the mines had closed, what then happened to Shirebrook? Sport Direct opened a factory there. Mike Ashley runs that company. It doesn't even pay the aggregate of the minimum wage to its workers there. Most of them are on zero hours contracts. The working conditions are deeply unsatisfactory and deeply unsafe. Even an all party select committee in Parliament absolutely condemned Sport Direct for its employment, employment practice and what it does on that Shirebrook site. Now, our media sometimes have difficulty concentrating on more than one subject at a time. Now, yes, everyone now condemns Sport Direct. They didn't for a very long time until Unite the Union got on the case and started giving it some publicity and giving it some money and giving it some campaigning. And so there are plenty of other places like Sport Direct around the country. So let's end zero hours contract. Let's end insecure employment. Let's demand not just a minimum wage, a real living wage, a TUC figure of £10 an hour as a start. And so those companies need to think again because in an economy directed by a Labour government things would be very, very different. And then there's Lloyds Bank which we all very, very generously in 2008 bailed out. We, we bought the bank, it was very good of us, all of us did. It's our money that's in that bank. And still a very large proportion of the shares are owned by the state. And the profits of Lloyds Bank have gone up by 101% in a year to 2.5 billion pounds. Now, fine, we've done, obviously done very well. And clearly it's the amount I pay for my mortgage that's helped them to make those huge profits. Um, but um, when a company does really well, normally human gesture would be to give something back to the workers. Yeah, they've done that really nice of them. They've given redundancy notices to 3,000 of them and they've closed 200 branches. Is that the kind of behaviour that a state-owned bank should be undertaking. Should we not be saying that that state participation in that bank or indeed any other should be used to pr put forward obviously good employment practices but also good investment practices so they invest in productive manufacturing industry in this country so that we're actually using the power of ownership of the bank to improve the economy for everybody. That surely ought to be the basis of the way in which we put our economy forward. And so when we talk of these things, we also have to challenge other issues in Britain. The grotesque levels of health inequality that exist. If you live in the centre of Hull, sadly, you're not likely to live as long as somebody living in a suburb. You know, sadly, in every city across Britain, there is a grotesque level of health inequality. You can take a bus across Glasgow and you can measure by the miles you travel on the bus the life expectancy that falls as you move from the wealthiest to the poorest areas. You can do that across every city in Britain. How do we deal with those issues? 
firstly with the health service, and I'll say a bit about that in a moment, but also by the question of the approach to education and the economy. About public investment in people that need that help, need that support, and communities that need that help and that support. Our NHS, our National Health Service, is our proudest creation as a Labour movement. Free at the point of use, Nye Bevan, 1948. And he said it would only last as long as there are folk around prepared to defend it. Well, we're well around, we're going to defend it to the end. So the Health and Social Care Act, which sells off half of NHS services to the private sector, that is going to go. That whole principle is going to go. We want an NHS of direct employment. We also want a properly funded NHS. The overcrowding at your hospital here in Hull is a problem. The pressure on the A&E department is a problem. You deal with that problem by investing enough money in the health service to employ the doctors, the nurses and all the other grades you need in order to put, put that right. We also have to look at the question of mental health within our society. We are facing a mental health crisis in Britain. One in four of us during our lifetime will experience some kind of crisis. Sometimes that can be dealt with by therapies, sometimes it requires greater support and greater attention from the NHS. But while we underfund our mental health services, remove all funding from many of the very good charity voluntary groups that do give support through mental health crises and not challenge the narrative and the abuse and the cheap and nasty language that's used against people going through a mental health crisis, it will get worse. We can all do something about that. We can all play our part in that. Ensure children in schools are not afraid to talk about their stress. Ensure that people in work are able to talk about the stress and bullying they may be receiving. A society that cares for all and reaches out to those who are in a difficult place is a better and more civilised society than those that simply abuse those that are going through mental health crises. When I mentioned inequalities, there's no greater inequality in our society than the way our housing system works. We have a government that simply doesn't understand what it's like to grow up in insecurity, in overcrowding, in badly maintained properties that you're paying through the nose for, that you could be evicted from at any time six months ahead. They don't understand what it's like for a child to grow up not knowing where they're going to be living in a few months' time, not having that security of knowing their home is their own. I know the Tories don't like council housing and the concept that goes around it, but I tell you this, the achievements of post-war Labour governments and many other Labour governments after that in building sufficient numbers of council housing have given people security of accommodation, given people somewhere to live and given communities somewhere to live. And so a Labour government will be investing in council housing rather than promoting its selling off, which is what this government is doing, and also regulating the private rented sector and also ensuring that young people and others who want to buy their own place will get some help in doing it rather than being priced out of the market. Why have we got the most expensive and worst quality housing in Europe? Because we have a government that believes only in free market solutions, not in intervention. And so it's about us and our party and what we do and how we do it. We're the party that promoted universal education after the Second World War. We're the party that promoted the new universities of the 1960s and 1970s. We're the party that brought in the Arts Council in 1978. We're the party that wanted to do all of that. But we made some mistakes. We made some bad mistakes when we started introducing fees for university education, which are now going through the roof. The grant system has been ended. 
and students are now leaving university with debts of up to £50,000. That has to change. Other countries in Europe, not particularly necessarily socialist countries anywhere across Europe, just simply say they don't believe you should penalise people for going to university. You should praise them and recognise that we all benefit from somebody that goes to university just as much as we all benefit from somebody that gets a good apprenticeship or a good qualification. Can we treat education as a right for all of us, not a commodity for those that can afford it? It's a philosophy that we have to adopt here. And so people say, well, what has Labour achieved in the past year since that momentous election last year when the leadership was won by us, actually, by all of us who want to see a different and better world. I'll tell you what, we've defeated the Tories 22 times in Parliament. We knocked them back on working tax credits. We knocked them back on forced academisation of schools. We forced them to withdraw the cut of personal independence payments. We forced concessions out of them on the trade union bill and so many other things. That's because we as a party worked together to achieve it. And that's clearly had a resonance because party membership has gone up from 200,000 to 540,000 during that period. We're now the largest socialist party anywhere in Europe. We've achieved that because so many people have come together. Because it's what we want to achieve as a party, what we want to achieve as a community. A principle, a principle that we don't pass by on the other side when people are up against it. Why have we got a homeless crisis in Britain? Why have we got so many people sleeping on the streets of this country? Is it right? Is it necessary? Is it a proper way of doing things? No, no and no. It's a question of having a government that wants to invest in housing, which in turn creates jobs in order to deal with that problem, rather than creating a market only to achieve those things. But it's also about fairness across the whole of the country. Why is the 22 times as much public sector investment in London and the South East compared to the North East of this country? It's a gross inequality. Just as much as it's a gross inequality, the levels of investment in the South West and the North West. There has to be a national investment bank with regional investment banks, John MacDonald has outlined this extremely well, the way in which we will have a government that's prepared to intervene to ensure the infrastructure is there, the good quality rail lines are there, the basic transport infrastructure, including access to broadband, is there, and a preparedness to support the development of new industries, of green technology jobs, of all the jobs that we can achieve if we have a growing high-tech economy in an environmentally sensible and sustainable way. That will create jobs, that will give opportunities for young people, that surely has to be the right way forward. It's the attitude the government is prepared to deal with. So, our party is about uniting people. It is about equality of opportunity at the workplace. It is about an expanding economy. It is about a society of social justice. A pension system that works for all, doesn't penalise women because they didn't work as many years as men, often through childcare, forced to work longer for less in order to get lower pension. A gender pay gap that has to be closed within our society. Well done Barbara Cast on the Equal Pay Act of 1970. Well done the women of Fords that struck for equal pay and helped to bring that about. Well done all those campaigners, but we've got to go a lot further, a lot faster within our society. A big increase in um, unpleasantness, in hate crime, in racist incidents across our society. I simply say this. Blaming a minority for the lack of housing, for the problems of a hospital, for the difficulty of a school places, won't actually solve any of those problems. The 
only way, the only way is learning the lessons of the past. When we come together as a society, come together as communities, demanding social justice for all, demanding education for all, healthcare for all, and housing for all, we are not just stronger in ourselves as a community, we also achieve those things and help to reduce the levels of inequality in our society. Our party brings in people from every community because we're determined that every community will contribute and will benefit from the economic expansion that we want to bring out and the kind of decent social justice that we're going to achieve in this country. That is a basic Labour way and a Labour principle. Richard quite rightly talked about other issues around the world. I've been in Parliament for a long time and I have been appalled at what went on, particularly in the run-up to the vote on the Iraq war. I voted against the intervention in Iraq, not because I was a supporter of Saddam Hussein, I was actually a lone voice in the 1980s against selling arms to Saddam Hussein, so it's not as if um, I was a Johnny come lately on the issue. I just felt that that intervention, that war, would lead to a turmoil of war after war after war all across the region, greater instability great danger and greater threats to the security of everybody. That's why I was uh, pleased is the wrong word, but uh, glad of the opportunity to analyze what the Chilcot report has said and say that I think we made a fundamental mistake in 2003. And I was prepared to say so and admit that. And I want to be, I want us to be a Labour government that will see as the watchword of its foreign policy human rights, justice and democracy around the world rather than the ideas of intervention often on behalf of the United States. Surely we want to live in a more peaceful world, not a world of greater war. This leadership campaign has been brought about because a number of people decided they wanted to have this campaign. That's absolutely fine. I'm very happy to be doing it. We're having public rallies all over the country, and so we don't spend too much money on it. We're making them all open-air rallies. The weather has been absolutely great so far. And last night, the weather in York was absolutely perfect. I finished my speech at two minutes past eight, and at four minutes past eight, the heavens opened and the rain came down. That's timing for you. But it's also giving us the opportunity to bring people together, thinking of the kind of world we can, should and must live in, thinking of what our politics has to be about. Our politics has to be about giving every child that opportunity to go to a good nursery, to go to a good school, to be able to develop their creativity, and I believe very strongly in the creativity that's there in every child for music, for art, for literature, for life. And then, as our young people get older, those chances of college and university, so they can contribute to a growing economy and a, and a better society as a result of it. If we allow the Tories to remain in office, what are we going to get? Greater inequality. We're going to get the bargain basement Britain, where they cut corporate taxation, cut taxation for the very richest, allow the wages to drift down and be more and more exploitative at the workplace, and a Britain on the off offshores of Europe that is one of deep inequality rather than one of decency and social justice. I know which one I want to live in. I think I know which one you want to live in. I think I know what our movement is really about. It's about uniting people. It's about learning from our past. But above all, it's about our party rediscovering its roots, not rooted in in the 19th or early 20th centuries, but rooted in the values of justice, the values of socialism, the values of social justice, made ready for a 21st century where the issues we face are, yes, of climate change, yes, they are issues 
uh, that face the whole planet. But we face those issues with humanity. We face those issues with intelligence and sense. But above all, we face those issues on the basis that every human being matters. Nobody should be left behind. Nobody should be left in desperation. Nobody should be left in poverty. And nobody should be forgotten in our society. That is what's making our politics so exciting. That's what's bringing people together. And that is why I'm so grateful to you for coming here today in Hull. Tonight we're in Leeds. We're travelling the whole country with that message. That message of hope. The message of enthusiasm. The message of the kind of world we can all live in. Thank you very much. Come on, everybody, come on. Shall we be called?